I don't have LinkedIn, so mm. like I cannot understand the. I don't like that they tell you who someone's looking it? at your profile. No, who, who, who? Tell me who. We <laughs> <laughs> must, must pay. Must pay. Why must pay? No, you tell me who. Welcome back to another episode of The Hot Pot, where we hop into different pots of spaces people find themselves in during life's transitions. I'm Joey. I'm Q. And I'm Nick. And speaking of transitions, right guys, we're going to be talking about transitioning into our very first jobs. First jobs? Like uh, student to wow. like working. Like, that was uh, some um, time some back. back. Yeah. Some time to review our age. Back. Yeah? <laughs> okay, do you remember your first job? Yes, uh, I sell uh, Chinese New Year snacks at Takashimaya. Hey. The, the actual, Do you have to wear a black t-shirt to put the yes. thing there? Oh my god, I love I that! I can top that. I don't wear Boogie Street. Seven dollar t-shirts. Was it the Singapore t-shirt? Uh, no, 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 no. Miss, little Miss. Uh. Yeah, little Miss shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, so has your highest level of education helped or contributed to you finding your first job? First job after graduating, right? I actually did art. I went into um, being an art teacher and not music instead. Cause oh, yeah. I feel like with music, it's a bit different. I didn't want to go into music education. Mm. I wanted to go into performance, which requires a lot of creative juices and inspiration. And I felt like if I had went straight into working as a, like into teaching or, you know, it would drain my creative juices a bit. Like I want to do anything but music. You leh? I got a diploma in hotel management mm. and I actually went through like two internships. Okay. One is for the hotel and... I actually enjoyed being in the hospitality industry. Mm. However, I know that it doesn't pay very well. Mm. Mm. And the hours are long and you have to do shift work. La. So you picked the luxurious life in the media industry. It's not luxurious. <laughs> <laughs> Just slightly better. <laughs> no, better for me. Yeah, but after graduating from poly, I realized that I wanted to go into media. Um, so I applied for uni. I wanted to get into Wee Wee in NTU. But I didn't get in, so I decided to take a gap year. The next year, I actually got into NTU, but it wasn't the course that I wanted. Mm. So I had to decide, do I want to spend four years studying a course that I'm not super keen in, or should I just go for an internship and then see how things go? Mm. And then that's where I decided. So if you had gotten into Wee Wee, then maybe... I think things would have been different. Eh? You have gone to uni, right? Yeah, my right life's now. trajectory might be different. During the gap year, I decided to go for an internship in a media company. Mm. And that's how I got my ticket into... Doing a, being a producer. But I think a lot of people look at qualifications more like not really necessarily what you've done. They just want to know that you've pursued an education. It's mm. a bit odd. It doesn't need to be in a relevant industry sometimes. Mm. You know, have you read, read the job description? Like they say they need to have to the highest years. level of education is a degree, but they never say what, in, what, what, right? in yeah. what. Yeah. I am quite fortunate to be one of the few people who from very, very early on and when I was very, very young, I already knew what I wanted to do, which mm. is to be in the media industry. So um, I went, I studied mass comm in poly, like in the end poly. And then um, at that point of time, I already knew I'm going to be in the media industry. Like. Mm. So just when the media industry was the bit that has been quite flexible over the last few years. So mm. I, I think like my education played a part in helping me get my first job. Because like the things I learned in school and things mm. like that helped train me a bit. Like. So I had a bit of an advantage compared to people who were coming in fresh. How did you know that you wanted to do Wow. Yeah. Okay, so actually, I always wanted to be on radio. Mm. When I was... Mm, I remember it. When I was 10 years old, I listened to the Martins on oh. 9-7 when I was studying for exam. Mm. And then I was like, I want to be on radio one day. After that, I asked my parents like, how to be on radio. They said, go and study mass comp. Okay, mm. oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, your parents yeah. support knew it. what to say. Yeah. 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 Okay, so on Reddit, right, the, this user, how xiao ah? How xiao ah? Oh, it's a how xiao ah. Oh, ooh. how xiao is small. Yeah, how xiao is funny. Yeah. funny. I think it's how xiao. <laughs> Maybe it's both. Okay, anyway, what did you, what did you say? He says, how did you cope with the transition from school to work life? As someone who is about to start their first full-time job after uni, the mm. thought of me working office hours and longer for the rest of my working year sounds super daunting and depressing compared to school life where you have semesters. How did this major transition in life affect you? Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Actually, I never thought about it that way. Like, you know how when you're in school, it's kind of mandatory. You have a timetable. Everything is planned out for you. Mm. You just need to show up and then they give you instructions and you follow. Yep. Whereas with work, it's like finding a job. The, I think the transition of finding a job is harder than going to work. Because mm. mm. the same thing when you go to work, you know what time you have to get there. Mm. They tell you the meeting. Mm. You just go, you do the work. When I was in poly, 
I I interned every like holiday. So I had four wow, internships. Hustler, what he from poly days hustling <laughs> eh? So yeah. I had four internships throughout poly. So actually, at that point of time, I was quite. I have seen quite a few different workplaces and oh. how different people work. What like kind that. of internships do you do? So I interned at a radio station. Um, I was a journalist, and like a reporter for a newspaper for one internship. Um, I was a writer at like a lifestyle magazine for another mm. internship. At that point of time, I was like, oh, okay, this is what an office looks like. Mm. But I think the thing that really prepared me the most for actual work, right, is army. Oh, wow. So the two years okay. in NS, right, I mean, after your your basic military training, come yeah. out of the Kong and things like that, I was posted into the Air Force. So I was an officer in the Air Force. It was really about like how you work with other people. And then a lot of the people that I worked with were, were regulars, means they signed on. Mm. So these people, for them, it was really their job. Mm. So then they, they treated you as a colleague. Ma. Yeah. Yeah, so then yeah, it was really that dynamic and it was a lot easier to transition from that into an actual, like, mm. into my actual first job after I, I OR'd it. Mm. Right. Mm. I think for me, actually quite similar because I started off as an intern, right? So it wasn't like a full-on, full-time job. Mm. I can clock out at like 6pm yeah. or even earlier, you know? Yeah, mm. yeah. So, so it didn't feel very stressful and that made the transition easier for me. I, I didn't even think like I'll be staying here for one, two years, you know what I mean? It was like a six month internship. Then I can just leave what? Mm. Right? As I grew older, I feel like it's scarier. Because we've already been through like seven years of working, right? Mm. Then you know your sometimes your friends and you will have this conversation, Oh my god, are we supposed to just work for the rest of our lives? Yeah. That that feeling sucks, mm. you know? Yeah. That when, when you realize, oh my god, I have to wake up every day from Monday to Friday yeah. to work. How many more Mondays do I have to deal with? Sunday oh. scary. Yeah, Sunday scary so you know? Yeah, but for me, I never felt that um, working was scary. I actually have like a lot of nightmares of me failing my O-level math and not graduating from poly. Oh. So my fear was more of not moving on in life mm. and being stuck in a specific stage. Career-wise, there's, I wouldn't say options, lah, mm. but you can technically choose you mm. have that choice that period before you started work right did you do anything special to prepare okay i always make it a point when i go to an interview i will wear a blazer uh. because that's what you're taught in school yeah, yeah like yeah, they yeah, literally yeah, teach yeah. you a firm handshake you, know, yeah. you must walk you must go to the front of the class my first interview fresh out of graduating for that art um, instructor position i took it very seriously so i wore a blazer i wore like heels and i walked into the art studio right and then <laughs> My boss was in like damn lap up clothing. <laughs> she was like wearing um a shirt with holes and yeah. paint all over. Okay. Art she then oh. she carried this like sling bag, right? The sling bag was also dirty one, like a lot of paint <laughs> yeah. everywhere. And she took out a notepad from her bag, right? Like like you know the blues clues kind. <laughs> then she write down what she wants from me. On that paper, eh? She said, okay. So that's your JD. So yeah. she asked me like what what you what what you good? Tell me more about yourself. You like to paint? Okay. You like children? Okay. Can then this is the pay. Then she tear. Sha. Then she hit me. Oh Are you God. okay with this? That's your contract being signed, Joe. You done pow pow. I just tear with fire blazer, like this is very weird. She sit like that somehow. Like, you yeah. her. And literally that that week, right? I met her and she said, Okay, I'm gonna go to Australia for two weeks. Uh the studio is yours. So she gave me the key and I had to take care of the studio for the next two weeks. Mm. So my first job was literally <laughs> running a business. My first job was in a public relations agency. And it was very strange because I thought like, you know, it was a young agency. It's not a very big company and things like that. So I wore like this to work. And then they told me I have to wear shirt and pants and dress shoes and tuck in my shirt every, every day. day. Like my PR? boss actually told me you must tuck in your shirt. Yeah. So then I found out after that that it was quite a traditional agency, I really felt the Sunday scaries every mm, Sunday. Right. My boss was sitting behind me and he would be the kind that would be like commenting on things on my screen, that mm, kind. Yeah. Wow. So it's like if I have WhatsApp open, I message my mother, I like, yeah, tonight I'm coming home for dinner. That kind of thing. Right. He'll tell me not to use WhatsApp at on during office hours unless uh, you are messaging a client. That's really strict. That sounds yeah. terrible. But I feel like these days, a lot of companies are more chill mm. about interviews also mm. like the way they are dressed sometimes if someone comes in informal I'll be like oh my gosh you're overdressed uh, I wouldn't say that out loud <laughs> oh, you're oh overdressed my god, oh my god like you don't have to do this yeah, yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah, what, yeah. What, what I'll be thinking you know good effort you acknowledge the effort yeah like, but 
if in doubt and you're going for an interview, right, you dress a bit smart better. Like, it's yeah, better smart to casual. overdress than, than better underdress. Better to be a bit uh. overdressed. I saw something on TikTok um, about, I was on FinTalk. This lady, she's Singaporean and she's spilling secrets about working in the big threes and all the, the mm. companies like that, right? And they say one thing that uh, big players look out for is like when you're having a lunch meeting or a dinner meeting and you're eating with big big clients, right? What they look out for is actually how you, what you do during the meal. One of the red flags is if you season your food before you eat it. Because... You never try it. Yes. Before. So some people, they immediately salt or they pepper before they eat, right? They actually take that as a, a red flag. I think what? overthinking. Yeah. Uh, overthinking. Isn't that in, intense? I think overthinking. Like, look, but I've heard like stories from friends like, okay, so she works in a, a Korean company that's more traditional. If, let's say, someone older than you wants to use the microwave, but it's your turn already, right? You have to let them go first. If someone who is bigger than you in the company, mm. higher up, right, is in the lift, you cannot take the lift with them. You have to wait for the next one. Whoa. But then your Things example like that, of that like the like... season, the food thing, right? To me, that is a red flag on the interviewer. Yeah. Yeah, if you are... If you're so particular... If, you're, if my work. hiring manager is extrapolating and coming up with random like opinions and judgments yeah. based on these sort of micro-actions, yeah. right? Yeah. Then you are the red flag. Okay, wait, question. If your employer asks you, what is your MBTI? You think red flag? Red flag. Why? Doesn't matter. First of all, it's not scientifically proven. It's not rooted in science or fact. Mm. And I know certain SMEs will make people take personality tests and things like that. Mm. And startups that make people take mm. personality tests be- during their interviews. This person was hiring like a salesperson. And then the MBTI or one of those things. La. It's an introvert. He's an introvert. Oh, cannot. Oh. Then I'm like, huh? But then if you get an extrovert, then the person annoying also cannot say anything. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So that like these sort of things have no bearing on yeah. whether you can do a job. Yeah. The first step to any successful salary negotiation is to subscribe to our channel. Do it. Now. Now. Right now. Please. Thank Please. you. Okay, so come my favorite part about the job hunting process is making your CV. Hey, oh. this is a LinkedIn king. <laughs> He's always mm-hmm. updating his LinkedIn. Only if you are like job hunting, then you would update your CV. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, if you Or like big wins, you know? Yeah, big wins. Then, you know, you update your LinkedIn to reflect big wins because I think it's important to be able to reflect on like achievements in your career. So it's not necessarily always about like changing jobs and things like that. Job hunting in recent years has changed quite a bit for me also because like early on, earlier on, you would need to actively apply, you would send your mm-hmm. CV out. I would call, like my first few jobs, I would call email to like companies, the gen- the general like email, you know, like the info at so and so, that kind, and then like, hello, are you hiring? Now, as I progress then, and with LinkedIn and things like that, then you have recruiters and headhunters who will reach out, yeah. Mm. So you have people in your network that will ask you, hey, there's this opportunity, are you interested? So then in those scenarios, the CV or portfolio is not as important la. But I would say that if you are in a creative industry, then your portfolio is actually super Very important. important. Yeah. yeah. Like your body of work, what you've done, more than like, I mean, in my line of work, more than um, your paper qualification. Yeah. So I have a lot of, I work with a lot of people who, you know, they, they have a super random diploma that's not in the creative industry. They don't have a degree, but then their portfolio is, is damn solid. Hey, that was me, but my portfolio, not solid. Hey, your portfolio no, is but solid. I was very passionate. Like, mm. as a, 20, 21 year old, I went to like film my own videos, take mm-hmm. photos. Yeah, so then that's, I created, that's your portfolio. La. Yeah, no, I created this whole like document. So I think when you explain and you show that you're super passionate and interested, I think the creative industry, people who are hiring in the creative industry will resonate with that. Yeah. 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 Must work. La. You must work. Oh, like, like fluff. Let's say, like, fluff. Fluff. like let's say I take a photo, like, then I'm like, your way the through, green la. represents like the need to preserve mother nature. Oh. The blue represents the water and how we take it for granted. Yeah, and I yeah. find that that really helps when you're applying for jobs. Okay, because uh, I think you have context. They don't have context about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, when you go into more technical, more senior roles, then a bit harder to Yeah, like, I cannot work like, like, yeah. at the If CEO. someone tries to smoke me, like, I... <laughs> can smell, like, can People smell. know if you're trying to smoke them. Any tips for students, right, with not much working experience, right, to build out a resume? Uh, go and do things on your own. Passion but projects. Passion projects. La. Yeah, mm. passion projects and then um, build your whole portfolio. It won't just only show your skill set, mm. but also your drive. Mm. Yes, like, I think work ethic is something that can shine through on your CV as well. Yeah. Mm. It's like LinkedIn. La. It's basically LinkedIn, but you compile in one page. Yep. I, I don't have LinkedIn, so mm. 
Like I cannot understand the I don't like that they tell you who someone's Opposite. looking at your profile. <laughs> Yeah, I, like, like who, who, tell me who. <laughs> Why must I pay? Why must pay? No, you tell me who. Who is looking at me? Pay. Oh, you pay. Oh, interested? Pay. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so if you don't have any work experience, there are many ways, and this is not just for creative industry. Like maybe you're in finance, architecture. There's so many things that you can do to up your skill set. Yeah. You know, before you even enter the workforce, maybe that's something that oh, like you skill future. Go, going to join, yeah, take up a course to further your skills. Because it shows that you're filling up your time while waiting, not waiting for a job, but yeah. it shows that you're working towards your goal. It shows yeah. your ethic that mm-hmm. you are willing to work on yourself, you're always improving, mm-hmm. and you're going to one up your own yeah. like, mm, achievements. So, whenever I'm hiring fresh graduates, the thing I always look out for is like, okay, every single thing that you are doing, right, whether it's like volunteering or like, even if you are like, oh, I'm going to take a gap year and go and travel, mm. completely fine. You don't need to be like a high-flying overachiever and like go and climb some mountain in Nepal or anything mm. like that. Um, even if it's just like, you know, oh, I just work part-time um, mm. and do f and in Singapore or anything mm. like that, right? At least like I know what sort of person you, do, you are or like what are you working towards ultimately. Do you think it's a red flag if someone tells you that during the gap year, they were just applying for jobs? No. I don't think so. But then they didn't do anything else? I think it's fine. I mean, it Mm. depends on the context. So like the last two years or three years, I feel for people who are like coming into the workforce because obviously economic Mm. downturn. It's been so hard to get a job. Job market is not great. So if someone is telling me that like, oh, you know, they've been just actively trying to look for jobs and like, honestly, it's been a struggle, right? Completely understand. Mm. Yeah, Because I think that's just like you are a victim of circumstance. Uh. Mm. It's been super tough. Mm. Even if you're qualified. How do you think fresh graduates can navigate this process? I feel like people put so much stress on themselves on finding a career straight away. But a career is built over time. You don't need to find something that will stick for long. And even if it's something that you, like you feel like you're very qualified for the job, you can't expect the employer to see that right away. Mm. Like maybe it's starting at entry level and then you work your way up. And and I've, I have a friend who who did that. She decided to do a, a mid-switch. So she went from a pretty high level. She had to start as an intern again. Mm. But within the year, she went back to, you know, pretty close to where she was before in a completely different role within the same industry. Mm. Mm. So I feel like sometimes it's about setting your ego aside. Mm. Yeah. If, if that's what you want to do in the long run, it's still an investment, right, in your career. Question board! If you could perform a duet with anyone, who would it be? I think... All the enjoyment. <laughs> I'm sad again. I think Ben King. Oh. You think you're the same, you man? I am a uh, king eh. <laughs> Or are they called like kingies? If you could have a love alarm that tells you who your true love is, would you use it on... A partner. Oh, meaning like if you're dating someone. Yeah, then, then like, you use them, they'll tell you whether it's really your tell you whether it's your soulmate or not. The thing is, I don't believe in soulmates. Huh? I don't believe that you're just meant to be one person. No, I don't like, believe in the one, yeah, but I believe in soulmate. Um, I would not want to know. Because if I'm super in love with this person, right, I wouldn't want to know. But if I'm a bit sus, then I press her. <laughs> tell me that it's wrong so that I can walk away. <laughs> would you rather give up cursing forever? I can't oh. fuck. Do that or give up taking private hire or taxi forever. Oh my god, this is like in France, right? Joey was asked whether he will give up sex or food. Then you don't know what we should to give up. I will be like, F- I cannot take taxi. F- at least I can say. F- <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will give up taking taxi. The most fortunate thing about being in our generation is that we started job hunting when LinkedIn was already uh, in existence. So I was talking to my dad, right? So he was a banker for like his entire career. Um, and each time he moved jobs, right? He was a headhunter that mm. headhunted. So I was asking him, hey, last time no LinkedIn, how people headhunt? It's just word of mouth like, oh, you're looking for this, this, this role. Uh, why don't you look for so-and-so in in this bank? And then I was, he'll be like, it's pager, you know? Wow, Mr. Yime. So like, then you take the pager number. Then after that, he will page. Then after that, say for like, wow, you then call and then go for a drink. Wow, I just had a revelation that like million dollar deals were done on a pager. Yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> okay. Sorry, Mil- uh, sorry for again. Mean, million dollar deals <laughs> were done by like Telegram last time also. Uh, <laughs> not Telegram, uh, but like the- Telegram. Yes, yes. Like, 
Yeah. Like, you know, you sign contract, then you must send the you dove. snail mail, eh. You send the dove over. <laughs> like, take one week to receive. Done. Can you start tomorrow? Right. Tomorrow, yeah. today? <laughs> or tomorrow? <laughs> How big an impact does your first job have on the rest of your career? Wow. Because technically, right, for all three of us, your our first jobs are still somewhat related to what we are doing Mine now. is super related, actually. Yeah. I actually cannot see myself doing anything else. I don't want to say anything else, but I feel like I will always be a creative. Mm. It's yeah. just what kind of creative will I be? But mm. it seems a bit scarier to um, hop into di- <laughs> hop into different, different parts of the spaces. <laughs> hop into another industry, or rather mm. like a sub-industry mm. in that sense. Because what can I provide? And I would have to start from like ground zero again, you know? This might be a bit taboo, but I feel like this is where some exposure jobs help mm. yeah. oh, for free, yeah. I hate saying that like mm. but it needs to benefit you also mm. you know like mm. if doing this job for lesser than you think is market rate mm. but will look great on your resume and help you get another job that will pay you mm. why not as a musician the, the bigger gigs you think that pay very well actually mm. don't mm. but because of those the exposure that it gives you it really does help you yeah. know, like if you get a name out there, la. Yeah, you mm-hmm. get an opportunity to work with a bigger company or get I don't know whatever yeah. I don't know corporate top. There are a lot of like the big MNCs that you know. Obviously, there are those that pay very well because mm-hmm. you know they want to attract the best talent. But there are those that also are on the flip side where they are very reputable companies. Um, and this applies to SMEs and startups as well. Reputable companies, but they know that people want to work for them. So, so they bring the, so they bring the salary wow. down. They they undercut you. They don't pay as well. But it's because people know that like well, people will come want to come and yeah, work for us. Yeah, it will look anyway. on, good on the resume anyway. Yeah. They know that they kind of sucks that they take advantage mm. of that. So I was looking for a full time job ready from mm. from the get go. And then this company they initially offered like oh we like your experience and things like that. But um because you are quite fresh, do you want can we will you do an internship like six months mm. and then we convert you, um, again, but there's always like no guarantee so what i would always recommend for like for people new to the workforce right is make sure that anything that is mentioned or dangled in front of you during the interview right you get it in black and white mm. so if they're saying that like six months then you com- we offer you a full-time role after that right make sure you get that like you will automatically be converted into a full-time role mm. after the end of these six months unless stated otherwise in your contract as well Yes I think read your contract Yeah Because oh I know so many people Who are like They do the six months Then they go like mm, Actually We are not 100% sh- certain yet Would you extend for another six months Oh my god It's the donkey and carrot thing So what happened was that Like I ended up agreeing to like a, Okay fine You don't I, I was quite insistent I don't want to intern uh, They were like Fine We'll take you But for the first X number of months Your salary will be X And then mm-hmm. after that When you pass your probation Then your salary will be Y mm-hmm. So then I was like, okay, I'm fine. Yep, yep. Yeah, but in hindsight, I feel like I should have stuck to my guns a bit. La. When it comes to your salary, you cannot just ask for the amount, but you need to prove why you deserve it. So for mm. example, you need to list your skills and also what you can provide to the com- for the company. La. Yeah. yeah, I think negotiating is very scary. That's the hardest part. Just go. Yeah. No, I, go cannot, ju- I cannot. I very, I mean, I'm very stressed. Imposter are- syndrome. If you are changing jobs, then typically now, I think a lot of like HR people or HR teams are a bit more transparent. Mm. So in the past, it used to be a case of like, oh, what is your last drawn? Mm. And then that mean, basically means that if your first ever salary drawn, right, you got screwed over and you are being mm. underpaid, right? Then the rest of your career, if everything is benchmarked against that, then you will just be underpaid your entire career. Oh my gosh, can people I People lie. That? I've heard of people lying eh. People lie, but I wouldn't say you should lie. So I think, to be honest, right? Um, you don't need to mention. You don't about, need to mention need to... like your last run salary. Why they ask you? I think you can just upright, like upfront, say that oh, I prefer not to disclose. But my expected is a certain. Because you have the right to keep it confidential, actually. But there are companies that like have HR mandatory HR policies that um, they do not budge on. They will say we insist on knowing. We yeah. need to know. So then it's up to you to decide whether that is a company that you really want to work for. La. Yeah, mm. yeah. I had an experience where they didn't want to match my last drawn because I didn't work long enough. They didn't want to match what? my last drawn. Mm. Yeah. Like, it wasn't long enough in their eyes. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So I think that's the thing where disclosing your last drawn very rarely works in your favour. 
Yeah. If it's too high, they will say, mm, we cannot match. If it's too low, they will say, oh, okay, la, we will match. Mm. Uh, that will, we will use that as a benchmark. Yeah. So I think so that's the high. thing. Yeah. Then go low. Um, usually, I will just go in with what is my expected. Uh, but obviously, mm. don't, don't like, do your market research yeah. and all that first. La. Yeah, later so, you go in and then you disappoint. You're, you disappoint the whole company. So what you can consider doing also is just straight up asking like, oh, what is the budget allocated for this role? Wow. Wow, that one will be straightforward. I'll be scared. Which I have... Uh, which I have done before. Like. Oh my god, then what did they say? They will just tell you. I mean, some will just tell you and some will say, oh, we can't disclose at this point of the interview. Mm. In fact, I also cannot disclose my last round. Yeah, but oh. typically... You typi don't say, I don't say. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, typically, if it's a case where they are very interested in you mm -hmm. as a candidate, yeah, and, like yeah. you think it's a good fit, and if you are excited about the company, the company is excited about you, then there needs to be some give and take yeah, in terms of being true. transparent about, like, you know, numbers. Mm. La. Yeah. yeah. Actually, on that note, right, have you ever based a decision to accept or reject a job on their Glassdoor reviews? I've never, but I love reading Glassdoor reviews. Like, it's like Reddit thread. Wait, have you ever contributed? No. no. Okay. Oh, someone... Huh? Okay. Yeah, tell us more. I tried. But must must put your email on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like... Scared, I was yeah. like... Scared. She comes scared. Yeah. And then, email... But w. W. <laughs> I come on W and I uh, Not enough Not worth the effort To make another mm. account To do it Right right I mean I think the thing is Like Glassdoor reviews Interesting to read mm. um, Typically People will generally say That there's no smoke Without fire So if like Every single review Is a bad review And then there are A lot of them Then not a great sign mm. But One thing that I will caveat Is that Disgruntled Unhappy Employees Who leave under negative circumstances are more likely to leave a negative review than happy employees who leave uh, would leave a positive review. It's like good comments won't come as yeah. easily as bad comments. Mm, yeah. yeah. That's true. So, need to take a pinch of salt. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a good way to understand the, the location and the environment because it's like Google reviews. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, basically yeah, yeah. Google reviews. Google reviews are not all real. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Similarly, for Glassdoor reviews, right, I have also heard stories of like certain uh, um, company owners or bosses or like founders, right? They will go and own self review their own company. Eh. Then they own self say, own self say the founder very good, CEO very good, the uh, boss very good, environment good, great great culture, culture great benefits, uh, good career progression. Yeah, but actually, it's the person own self, right? Okay, guys, any tips for our young graduate viewers who are entering adulthood, taking on their first jobs? If you have the financial means to like... Take it like, easy. Tough it out for a bit longer oh. and to hold on a bit longer, um, don't rush into the first job offer that you get. Because like, even from my point of view, having been in the workforce for a while, this ha is a quite a challenging time and challenging job market. Mm. So options aren't like as plenty as compared to a couple of years ago. So, you know, don't just rush into a, a, a job that, you know, you're going to like burn out in uh, or that you will hit. Um, take your time to look for the right role and uh, eventually the market will get better. La. So have some faith and optimism in that. If you have the opportunity to go through internships, I think you should. Mm. Because mm. you then experience different work culture and different types of people mm. and then you understand what you truly like and what you, you truly dislike. Aside from that, I think you mentioned before that don't be afraid to take on part-time jobs. Mm. Which I never really thought about it until you mentioned. Like, why are people so ashamed of taking yeah. part-time jobs, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's the other thing. You are young. Your entire career and life is ahead of you. Yeah. So what, whatever you do or whatever decisions that you make in the next one, two years, they will have very little bearing or impact um, on the rest of your life or career unless you choose to make it so. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And don't feel pressured about what you see online. I think people only share the good things and sometimes people share fake things, like mm. fake good things. So don't be pressured by other people your age who are celebrating big wins when you haven't even found a job. Yep. You know, like we are all on different timelines, we're all on different circumstances too. So mm. do your own thing, like know your worth, know when it's time to stand your ground, know when it's time to maybe make a little sacrifice for the sake of like a better future i think networking is so important basically expanding yeah you're meeting people that could maybe further down the road offer you an opportunity yeah. talk mm -hmm. to them you know yeah 
Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of The Hot Pod. Please subscribe to us if you haven't already. And of course, you can also listen to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and me listen as well. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. I saw him try to hide a yawn, right? Yeah. Then I almost burst, eh. He <laughs> suddenly like this. <laughs> then his eyes suddenly very wet. Then I'm like... <laughs> yeah. She saw he looked at me like that. <laughs> <laughs>